this last, last lecture um, ends our discussion of of the simple case of of filling uh, our space groups with ions and the rules that apply to creating the kinds of structures that could really exist in nature. And uh, in this case, uh, Pauling's rules three, four, and five are generally not as important for most uh, crystalline materials, although although you know they're useful to think about, and so we'll go over them. Uh, in particular, uh, number three is kind of valuable when looking at more um, amorphous structures that have polyhedron in them, and it tells you kind of how they might bond to each other uh, locally. Uh, but overall, um, they're generally, you know, like I said, the, the first two pretty much tell us uh, what to expect in terms of probably trying to narrow down the options of space groups for particular combinations of elements. So rule number three is the linkage of coordination polyhedra in a structure is such that the edges, especially faces, tend to not be shared. So this comes down to, you know, um, like we had shown when we maybe look at a cubic structure, uh, you know, it is possible that when you consider, you know, two choices for some sort of crystal structure uh, or space group, that in one case maybe the the tetrahedron are are such that uh, when you look at you know atom A or something uh, and, and it's got a tetrahedral uh, structure here, you know the next tetrahedron over here is actually you know uh, joined by the by the corners, right? And that the pockets don't have the tetrahedron lying along edges or something. And uh, the reason that's hard to show is that all the structures we do know about usually are that way, meaning that um, it is indeed this rule that uh, the polyhedra are generally not connected by the edges. They're usually connected by a point. And I think if you go back and look at some of the structures I showed you or any other ones and look at it from a polyhedron point of view, the polyhedron are not close to each other. They are separated. Um, it's a little bit easier to think about, by the way, uh, in structures where the polyhedron are free to move about during processing like glass or something like that. And it's fun to show you the calculation, you know, for um, SiO4. Uh, so, uh, you know, these are the tetrahedron floating around uh, in a, um, I can just draw this with any old, you know, let's make that silicon. It's probably like a horrible tetrahedron, but it's meant to be something like that. And, um, so the silicon bond is bonded to four in the tetrahedron like that, right? And, um, you know, the question is, um, you know, these kinds of tetrahedron, when they're not in some uh, crystalline space group, uh, can this actual rule be, show, you know, can we kind of estimate how they're going to be uh, um, uh, arranged? And we can do the calculation here by saying, well, silicon 4 plus its strength is obviously 4, since I put it right there, and it's coordinated by 4, so it's 1. And uh, the oxygen at a shared corner, like if we imagine that this tetrahedron touching another one, sub 0 then I would have two, each one being a half, is the QO, right? And then half if I'm only sharing it with one other tetrahedron, right? And that equals one. And so that says, yes, if I look at the oxygen perspective, 
uh, these match, which means that each oxygen can only be bonded to one other one, which means that I would have a situation where this oxygen can be bound to another tetrahedron back here, like that. And, uh, and so you'd expect to see a lot of them touching like this. And so this one would be bonded to another one. And that's what you see, actually. So you can use these rules for chains of things and rings that are not necessarily crystalline. So, you know, this is kind of a general thing for polyhedra. I mean, from our perspective, thinking about crystalline, when, you know, like I said, if you had a choice of, let's suppose that rule one and rule two bring us down to, uh, you know, a couple choices, and one of them requires, you know, let's say two tetrahedron to be attached at the edge like that or something, then uh, uh, the one that in the crystal structure had the tetrahedron, you know, uh, like this, uh, would be the preferred one. And obviously it comes up, which is why you have rule number three, uh, if you were actually trying to build up uh, these uh, structures from, from ground zero. And the reason for this, by the way, gets a little bit back to uh, the uh, the energy argument. And notice again how we're putting this together with these rules, and we haven't even used any kind of you know bonding energy calculations or anything, right? So the way that you can think about this rule is that if I had looked at the atom inside this polyhedron here, obviously they're far apart if I'm touching at the tip. And if I share edges, it brings these much closer to each other. And so you would expect the energy to go up because they would start to feel each other. And the, and the closer, the more things I share, the more that the cation would be uh, getting closer to another cation, raising the energy. So it's another way to look at it. So again, uh, another final rule to, um, to further separate a couple choices if, if it's ambiguous. Pauling's rule number four, uh, since sharing of edges decreases the stability, uh, we can then say with some general rules that if you have cations that have a huge amount of charge uh, and a low coordination number, they definitely do not want to do that. And that's, of course, uh, pretty obvious because um, what I was just saying, actually, is that with the very high cation charge, if I share edges, then I'm bringing two cations with a uh, very high Q closer to each other um, and without a high coordination number there's not a lot shielding it either and so uh, this would make perfect sense again number four versus number three seems to be uh, you know like you'd only need number four uh, if um, you know, there was an option for sharing polyhedral edges that didn't look too bad, and your cation had a very high charge, then it would choose one structure versus the other. But now we must be really getting into the weeds, and then that's true with Pauling's rule number five, where the number of different kinds of atoms in a structure tends to be small. There's two ways to interpret this. One is that um, you actually just want to keep the numbers and compounds down. Or, you know, you could picture, well, uh, I could throw in the entire periodic table and it's not going to crystallize into one, uh, into one kind of, um, uh, you know, crystal structure. It would separate, as we know, from phase diagrams into a bunch of different ones. So uh, it's a little bit of a, um, a you know, strange one. The other possibility in interpreting this could be said, well, uh, the atoms have different coordination and that you could, you know, somehow end up with atoms, the same atoms with different coordination. It also seems obviously difficult. So I'm not really uh, sure when number five would apply, but it's obviously under very rare cases. So that's it. And uh, in the next lecture, we will start to now... Um, take crystal structures, these are space groups with atoms in there, and we'll start to think how do we represent their properties now on a more macroscopic scale. 
And to do that, we'll use tensor notation so that we can represent more properly the anisotropic properties of crystals, the, anisotrop the anisotropic materials properties of crystals um, can be represented with tensors.